Thank you for welcoming us into your headphones. I am Chema. And I'm Eddie. And this is our top 10 for 2020? 2020. This is the rollback. Is the rollback. <laughs> oh, right? Every time. So good to be back, man. So good to be back. Welcome back, Chema. Holy shit. It's been, oh, what, a month? A month. I took a, I took a bit of a, a, bit of a break. Bit of a break so I can uh, catch up on other projects that are not as nearly as fun as this, but it's good because I got to return to do probably one of my one of the highlights of the end of a year, and it is this uh, our annual top ten favorite films of the year. We stopped doing the top ten worst because what's the point of even talking about bad movies anymore? But I believe it was uh, music critic Talk Nathanson who once said, and I'm going to quote him directly here, said, the dawn of a year, of a new year is for cleansing, time to hose off the bird crap stain in the windshield of life. Let us consign bad memories into the dusk of history. Let's incinerate them like so many pictures of our ex-girlfriends. Let us toss it into the garbage like the leftover ham from a month ago that we forgot in the back of the fridge. We are deleting it all from the collective hard drive so that we may have space for next year's terrible terrible movies so this is our top 10 favorite films of the year holy shit man you you didn't fuck around with that one did you i am so ready because last year i'm not gonna stay i'm not gonna stay on topic too long but last year was a shit show and that's like that i'm i'm only talking about like movie wise because this broke my rhythm okay i was used to going to the theater once sometimes twice a week okay um and this just didn't cut it you know i haven't been to a movie theater since march of last year and this is you know this is making me a a thing so the the number of movies that i saw last year was very limited very small and most of them were on streaming but i feel like this made me more selective and the movies that I that I decided to spend time on, the movies that I wanted to watch, and I think I found some really nice little jewels that were both very accessible and very very fun. So I'm really excited to talk about my favorite films of the year. How did you take it? Uh, 2020 was a shit show that had like a decent season finale. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, pretty good uh, setup for the next one. I mean, honestly, I got to be real with you, man. Uh, this this year, my top 10 list has a bit of an asterisk with it because it was very limited on the movies I was able to watch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been with us for our first year of the rollback, you'll know that a good chunk of our movies haven't been 2020 releases. We've been looking at old films, reviewing movies that were had sequels coming out, you know, stuff like that, because we had to be a little choosy with what we could. You know, movie theaters were shut down for a while. Um, so that being said... I feel like my top 10 has a bit of an asterisk every top 10 every year. I kind of like to do a bit of a variety, you know, scary movie here, great action movie here, you know, drama there. Yeah. I like to have variety. And I feel like this year I didn't have as much variety as I would have wanted, but if anything, 2021 is shaping up to be a fucking amazing year with all the releases we're getting on either HBO max in theaters, Disney plus among other things, Netflix is set to have their biggest year on record for original releases are re- releasing at two movies uh, every week. So it looks like 2021 is going to be an insane fucking year for movies. And if you're up for it, man, I'm down to watch every single one of them with you. We are going to be busy this year. That's what you're trying to say. Hell yeah. And I'm looking forward to it, man. With all the releases that were pushed back from 2020. So how many blockbusters do we have for 2021? Like we're getting, ju- we're getting the Snyder cut and Godzilla versus Kong within two weeks of each other. Tuesdays back to back, and I'm will be sick both days. <laughs> Looking forward Looking to it, forward. folks. It's gonna be a good, good time. Good time, man. Um, before we start with our top ten, I do have a couple of honorable mentions that I, that I I, I do want to throw out because, yeah, uh, and uh, I, uh, also an asterisk. This is the first time. This is the first time this has happened. But half of my of my movies in my top ten. We got half animated, half live action. I'm not surprised. This I'm not is, surprised by you, actually. Yeah, you know me. I love me some animation. But let me count down uh, some movies that I enjoyed that did not crack my my top 10. Uh, first of all, Bad Boys for Life. Really fun action flick. Uh, Happiest Season. 
was a uh, was a nice little rom com that we got near the end of the year. Onward was a uh, was a really nice animated Pixar film that we got at the start of the year. Borat's subsequent movie film was a super unexpected, <laughs> funny ass comedy. Uh, Hubie Halloween marked the return of a fun Adam Sandler for the whole family in a nice Halloween film. Enola Holmes was a fun ride with great performances. And the last cut that I did for the top 10, this one hurt, but Freaky was left out of my top 10. That was such a fun, scary, new dynamic twist in the horror genre and comedy genre. I was really happy to see it. Those are my uh, recommendations throughout the year that did not crack the top 10, but that I really, really enjoyed. Do you have any any you'd like to mention or do you want to just jump into the top 10? Uh, I guess a few honorable mentions, which bear in mind, I don't have them listed. So if I forget some of my honorable mentions, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Superman, Man of Tomorrow uh, was really great. It's based off the Max Landis uh, American Alien comic books heavily. Mm-hmm. So- Big I mean, fan of those. Yeah. yeah, say what you want about Max Landis, but- And I do, what an asshole. <laughs> yeah, fair, fucking fair, he is an asshole. <laughs> But I'll give the asshole credit. He wrote, he's like, arguably my favorite uh, Superman comic series, American Alien. Like, I really, really, like, love that interpretation. Uh, and the animated movie was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, QB Halloween, I, I actually struggled to put it on my top 10. I'm like, but it's an Adam Sandler movie. But it's so good. But it's an Adam Sandler movie. But it's so good. It is so good. Um and I mean, if, if I think of any, oh, and The Vanished. Uh, Vanished. It came out very late 2020, but I just found out, but it's really good. It's a really great low budget psychological uh, horror thriller movie where shit just proceeds to happen in a cavalcade form, but it's a great movie. Uh, it's on Netflix. If you can watch it, watch it. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. Do you, you want to go first, sir? Uh, I'll go this. first. I'll go first. Uh, my, my number 10. I have a I have a history of putting number tens uh, as a, kind of a throwaway as like a, oh you know what I really wanted to talk about this movie more so I I wanted to slide it here um, because this movie took a while to come out but I and I know that it wasn't everyone's cup of tea but it definitely was one for me and my number ten is the New Mutants uh, uh-huh. such a niche thing. It definitely not for everyone. Definitely, I, I understand every criticism. I understand that, you know, it's not any of the characters that we've seen before. I understand that it's probably not characters that we're ever going to see again. But I love the new mutants. I love the mood of the film. I love the performances by the younger cast. I love the performance by the, by, by the older cast member. I like the effects. I like uh, the dynamic between everything that, that's happening. It was such a sweet and tender uh, character study into all these younger uh, mutants that most likely we're not going to see again. But you know what? As I I define this movie as an epilogue to the to the X Men that we know, um, kind of like a, as a little short last chapter of what could have been. And mm-hmm. or you know, if you decide to just watch this as a one shot that is not connected to anything else, it also works like that. Uh, Josh Boone is a super talented writer director. I'm glad that th- this was this and the and the, the Stan TV show was one of his what was his passion project. So the fact that he got to work on it, great. Uh, the New Mutants is probably not it, it it didn't have the legs. It didn't have the legs to keep a momentum going and keep attention to it. It it, w- it was dragged out for too long. But I think the final product was very decent and very much enjoyable and i have a soft spot for it a lot of people felt the same way about cyberpunk 20, 2077 you know they waited for it too long and then when it came out they were disappointed i wasn't disappointed by this i wasn't disappointed by cyberpunk but i wasn't disappointed by this <laughs> so number 10 new mutants underrated in my opinion uh i am inclined to agree with you it's not my dumb it's not my top 10 but i'm seeing new mutants uh i would say i would give it honorable mention mm-hmm. um <clears throat> Great, I don't want to say original movie, but great one shot. Uh, I would love to have seen what they could have done with it, you know, maybe make it a series. Uh, I think it could have easily been a part of the MCU, like they could probably find a way to include it in. Maybe Mr. Sinister was around the whole time or whatever, but anyway, uh, New Mutants, okay, I get that, not bad. Uh, so for my number 10, 
if you guys if, if you guys have been watching for a while, this is the moment where Eddie says that his number 10 can kick my number 10's ass, and then we just go back and forth. No, actually, I think my <laughs> number 10 and your number 10 could probably duke it out pretty well, depending on yeah. who we're talking to. Uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Wow. Okay. All right. This uh, is uh, <laughs> consider me consider me shocked. I thought this was going to be your number one. No, no. Wow. Um, yeah. So okay. 1984. Um, I know you haven't finished it, so you're you're about an hour in, right? As of this time, about an hour in. Yeah, I haven't finished it. So <clears throat> I'll just say this. So for the fact that there's no spoilers, and if you want to know my you know in depth thoughts from the time that you watch that you listen to this podcast. Go back one, and you'll see our review of 19, Wonder Woman 1984. And you'll see just how uh, blind I am when it comes to DC movies. <laughs> um, solid cast. I, to me, a good sequel. Had a lot of heart. I like the villain. Um, and I would just say this. Wonder Woman 1984 reminds me a lot of Spider-Man 2 uh, in the choices that Diana has to make. And for me, Spider-Man 2 is the best Spider-Man movie, period. Like, I'm including Far From Home into the Spider-Verse. To me, Spider-Man 2 is the best one because of the choice that Peter has to make. He has to make the hero's choice to do what is hard, you know. Um, in that capacity, Diana has to do the same thing. It, 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 it The first one made me like her. The second one made me respect her, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, and... Yeah, honestly, I can't recommend Wonder Woman 1984. Even if it, even as divisive as it is, you does you owe it to yourself to watch it to at least be able to say, "Hey, I have an opinion on this." Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's my number ten. That Wonder Woman 1984. Wow. Okay, we're starting out. You know, as a shock because I'm <laughs> now honestly I don't know where your list structure is gonna go. I have no idea. <laughs> You know, usually it's like, okay, I know the DC movie is going to end up in his number one, but shit, okay. Yeah. This is <laughs> this is scary. Okay. <laughs> 2020, man. What a way to end it. Wow. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. My number nine. My number nine, um, this is probably the most different movie in my whole list. This is probably the one that is the, the standout of the list. It's the most different one. Um and once again, I have to I have to shout out uh, my local cinema. I, I have to shout out my country, and I have to shout out for the first time in this list, for the first time in the show, my city. My number nine is I'm no longer there, or Jano Estoy Ahí, as it is uh, correctly called. This is a Mexican film. It was it was hey. it, came, it came out on Netflix uh, near the start of the year. And not only was it shot, made, written, and everything in Mexico, it was shot, written in Monterrey, which is my home city. It's really? my hometown. This is the place where I was born. It's the place where I'm living right now. And it is one of the most interesting looks at Mexico in, that I've seen in a film, like ever. Uh, Roma came out a couple of years ago, and that was fantastic. That was beautiful. But that was a very universal uh, experience. I feel, I feel like much like Parasite last year and Roma before it, that was one of those movies that you could watch it from anywhere in the world and you could identify what was happening. I'm No Longer Here is almost exclusively to hear. It's about this young gang member who, you know, ha hangs out with his friends and dances in the street and somehow ends up in this car that's taking him to the other side, to the United States, and he ends up in New York and he's just, he's no, he's so lost and he doesn't know what's happening and he's the whole movie has this beautiful perspective where you're not following a plot you're not following uh, a structure you are like a secondary character in this where you're just sitting right next to the main character and you're seeing him do what he's doing it's almost like you're watching an experience it almost feels like that scene at the start of Skyrim where you wake up in that cart and the man and the people just start talking to you you just walk around and see what's happening that's what I'm no longer here feels like it's such an experience it's beautiful you, you don't have to care about things like plot because character and personality and just mo the more the, this is the movie with the most beautiful shots in this year I think it's one of the, it's one of the standouts I think it's one of the 
just most entertaining trips that you can take in movie making during this year. If you haven't seen it, this is one of the mo- one one of the underrated films to watch. It had very little promotion, but the fact that Netflix has been backing it up and the fact that it is now Mexico's choice to send to the Oscars to represent the country in the foreign language film, it is a possibility that 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 it could win. This is one of the most entertaining films I've seen this year. I love taking that trip. It's going to be hard for me to take it again, but I can't wait to see it and just, you know, Viva Mexico, Viva Monterrey, Tarcos Forever, you know. I'm no longer here, ya no estoy ahí. Number nine, love it. Fair, man. I can understand how much uh, heart that movie had for you. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, man. Like, I, eesh. I feel like my number nine is complete shit now compared to yours. <laughs> um... <laughs> Again, just for pure spectacle, if nothing else, Tenet is my number nine. Yeah, go ahead. Um, And I want to be very clear. I understand a lot of people didn't like this movie. Again, it's a decisive one. I just happen to fall into the camp of like, I can can respect it. Um, Christopher Nolan, if anything, he is a very big experimental uh, movie maker, you know. Uh, Tenet, you know, no, I, I can easily say no other director could have gotten Tenet made, you know. How many directors can look a studio in the eye and say, here's my script. It's 90% concept. There's no main character. Give me $200 million to make this shit. <laughs> How many directors can do that and, and actually pull it off? You know, um, to quote a man from a, a closer look, it's one of the reasons why Tenet is so, to some degree, revered and to, other, to another degree reviled is because it's an experimental film where you don't really have a protagonist. You make him as basic as you can, that way, hopefully, the audience will instill themselves within him, and then you experience the story with him, if that makes sense. He, he was made as generic as you could possibly make a protagonist to a point where his fucking name in the titles is protagonist. You know, they made him as generic as possible for a reason. Um, and I understand that's not everyone's taste, and I understand the concept. Not everyone liked it, and everyone could enjoy it. I can respect the spectacle. I can respect the the idea and the willingness to experiment, you know, not get lazy. A lot of directors, you know, in their later years, you know, not saying no one's old, but like, you know, by this point, most directors rest on their laurels and they just continue to pump out the same shit over and over and over again. I respect the fact that Christopher Nolan chose to not, you know, oh, I'm just gonna keep doing the same shit over and over and over again. Like, no, this man knows how to write a story. So he purposely decided to challenge himself and say, can I make a movie where it's as close to an actual video game as a movie can get, where the main character is so bland, but the story is just a breakneck pace and you're experiencing everything. I respect it and I enjoyed it. Again, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm saying for me, it's the ninth best movie of the year because I like the concept and I liked his willingness to experiment. And again, those fight scenes are fucking legit. Christopher Nolan knows how to do a fight scene. And he's great at these concepts. So my number nine is Tenet. Right. I'm sorry. I wish I had the emotional connection that with my movie as, <laughs> as you do, but I fucking don't. Well, you know, the day when you or me or someone else makes the great uh, RGB movie, you know, that will come. That will come one day, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, number eight. This is this is when I get when, when I go back to you know turning off my brain and you know go dumb. Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Yeah. Really? Yes. This, wow, okay. This was such... Uh, this if, that, if, if Tenet was your spectacle, this was my spectacle. This was colorful. It was fun. It was bouncy. The fighting was great. The choreography was great. The performances were so fun. The characters were all entertaining. Birds of Prey is my favorite post a Dark Knight DC film. This is the to me the best one that they've done. Yes, I don't care. To me, this is the good one. This is the one that I happily will go back to, and I have come back to. Uh, the time where, where I had to rewatch Justice League to do the Justice League review with you and, and, and Amanda, I was kind of dreading it. Even when I was watching it, I was like, you know what? I'm watching it to talk about it, but my heart's not into it. 
um the, the same thing happened when I, or every time i try to rewatch um man of steel or or or, or batman versus superman wonder woman one i thought I, I think it's fine uh, aquaman i forget it exists but this one this is the good one man this is the, this is an example of how to make a fun movie that can that is a pseudo sequel to the to the to the suicide squad but that's also its own thing the performance is so great margot robbie is fantastic this is the exact this is, this is exactly the same thing of when ryan reynolds picked up a deadpool again and we're like this is the right person on the wrong circumstances the same thing happened with with margot robbie in the suicide squad this is margot robbie as 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 harley quinn in a good movie and she's giving a great performance because she has a better director but also she has better writer she she she's she's doing so much with this character the side characters are also great um uh ewan mcgregor as the villain is also great uh this is one of this is one of those movies that like is it was just always funny it was always on it never turned off and this is what those movies need to be okay between this fucking uh shazam and uh into the Spider-Verse, it is time that we take these superhero movies and we stop making them dark and we just turn them back into what made them good to begin with, okay? Make them colorful and make them fun because this is what they're supposed to be. This is where they thrive, okay? Not every superhero movie needs to be Dark Knight, okay? And this one proves itself by just working over and over again. I love Birds of Prey. I will happily watch it again. I will happily watch a sequel. I will happily watch whatever the fuck James Gunn is doing with these characters in in The Suicide Squad. But this is the one that I can that I that I can look at DC, and I used to look at DC with disdain, with boring, with everything. But now I look at DC, and like we're Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone at the end of La La Land. Like we we look, we see each other. We're not together, but we're like, you know what? We had a good one, and this was the good one. <laughs> Birds of Prey number eight. <laughs> fair, yeah. fucking fair. Okay, okay, I can, I can get behind that. Okay, uh, my number eight uh, goes definitively in a different direction. Um, Jesus. Okay, so my number eight is a little horror movie called Come Play. Uh, I don't okay. know. Have you have you seen it? I have not even heard of it, but tell me about it. So Come Play, uh, it's my number eight for a list of reasons. One, it's a good horror movie. It, it's, a, it's a genuinely good one. Um, didn't scare the shit out of me, but it stressed me the hell out. And I was really, like, interested. Mainly because the main character, the main little boy, uh, his character is meant to have a form of autism um he has trouble communicating verbally uh he uses mostly a phone and various apps to be able to communicate and there's this creature that's working through the phone to try and get to him in theory it's like not necessarily haunting his phone but using it as a device to get to him um and then there's a there's uh you know his parents are going through a rocky marriage because um popular opinion or not they're they confront a lot of the ugly things, not ugly things, a lot of their harsh realities when it comes to having a child with different needs. Um, and, you know, for example, the stress that it brings on the parents. And it's such a great movie because of that. It's such a great movie because it confronts those dark issues, those hard issues. Uh, and it's not overplayed. You know how some movies will portray a, a character with either um a disability like and they'll make it like a crutch or something that's wrong or something to be made fun of or a joke or something mm -hmm. this movie to me is excellent representation of what's the right way to represent someone who has autism or asperger's or someone who's mute or has trouble communication who needs um you know uh devices to communicate and they go in a lot of different directions that i wasn't expecting when it comes to like the bullies the parents the way they defeat the creature do they defeat the creature it's Come Play is a great movie that also has a great message that includes uh, a section of people that aren't normally included. It's something I would strongly recommend for people. Uh, if you haven't seen Come Play, I don't think you have to wait to Halloween. You can watch it now. That's that's the girl from Community, right? Um, it's Gillian Jacobs. I didn't recognize her, honestly. I was so focusing on the kid. The kid, that kid's a great actor. And also, that's the first movie on this filmography that I could find when I did research at the time. All right, number seven, right? 
Number seven. Let's uh, let's stay talking. Let, let's keep talking about superheroes because because we're we're not done with that. Uh, but this is a different uh, different kind of uh, of movie. Um, this I have a love hate relationship with this movie because I love the source material that it's based on. I like the movie in concept, but it's got a bit of an execution issue. But when I tried watching it again, I watched it a couple more times, I realized that it, the good parts do overwhelm the bad ones. I'm talking about My Hero Academia Heroes Rising. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. This is the last movie I saw in theaters. I went to the movies. I saw this movie. I saw this movie. I had tickets for this for two months before the movie came out. And two days after we saw the movie in theaters, they were like, everything's locked up. Stay home. <laughs> oh, we're damn. done. We're damn. Done. Yeah. And what what one to go out on? Uh, I've made no secret. I'm a big fan of My Hero Academia. Season five comes out in March. So, you know, can't wait for that. Um <laughs> But here's the thing about My Hero Academia Heroes Rising. If you're a fan of the show, you like the movie. If you're a fan of the show, you'll hate the movie. It is such a make or break thing because it's not for, it's definitely not for everyone. Uh, remember when we talked about the first movie about uh, about uh, two heroes? Uh, that movie, I think, in, was kind of accessible. You could watch it without knowing a lot about the show. Mm -hmm. This one, you need to be caught. Not only do you need to be caught up, you need to accept a lot of things. And that becomes a problem because of something that happens near the very end. I really don't want to get into spoilers, but I think the end of the movie kind of breaks the continuity of the show. That's a problem. But if we don't talk about the ending and we talk about the first three, the first three fourths of the film, this is <laughs> some of the most beautiful hand-drawn 2D animation in an action movie that I've seen in a while. Okay, this is like rival rivaling something like Akira. Like this animation is so good. Like they were given like a, a huge budget, and they made it. They they, they 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 make it. Okay, they make it. They they make it work. Uh, th this movie takes place in a summer. So this kid. So you got the whole class. The whole class one A is hanging out in this in this one island, and they're just doing hero work. And everything appears to be going good. And these animators take advantage of everything. It's the summer. It's colorful. The colors are bright. The the you you can see the beach. You can see the forest. You can see the small town. You can see this community and they just make the animation be so pretty and so in touch with how the show works that it becomes such a fun time just hanging out with the class 1a and the class 1a is great you know me i love i love my hero academia i love the class i love these characters so seeing them all just hanging out to me that's fun and at the end when you see like this big conflict this is probably the biggest conflict that that we've had in the show in the in the sto in the story so far every character gets a moment to shine. And that's the best part of the movie. The best part of the movie is when you see the whole class 1A, it's just back to back to back using all their abilities and you know forming this, this great plan. And oof, that's where the movie shines. The only reason why this isn't higher on the list is because I don't love the ending. The ending to me kind of breaks everything that's, hap everything that's been happening. And that makes me not uh, adore the movie. I love it, but I don't adore it. And because of that, it stays at number seven. But I, but I, would I, I, I am lying if I say that I didn't have the a blast watching this in theaters. Okay, I love watching anime, but every once in a while, watching an anime movie in theaters is great because it's like live theater. Honestly, people go fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have an opportunity once theaters back, oh, 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 open back up again, go watch anime movies in theater every time you get a chance because it's always fun. And this one, especially if you're caught up and if you're a fan of the show and you're just locked there with like a bunch of fans, it's a great two hour de-stressor of just, you know, going fucking crazy. Uh, I love my Hero Academia Heroes Rising. I have some problems with it, but, you know, I feel like if you love something, you should be able to openly be able to criticize it. So I like it. Can't wait to see. Can't wait to see some season five in March. Can't wait to see that new third announced uh, movie. Uh, 
I don't I, I don't understand the teaser. It's just it's just three three characters from class one A uh, with new suits and the line he will meet the three musketeers. I have no idea what that means, but I'm hyped. I can't wait to see this. Um, but this this was fun. This was my last movie in theaters. I can't wait to go back. But this was a great one. My Hero Academia, Heroes Rising, number seven. Shit. Okay. So again, this is another one where I'm like, I wish I was more passionate about the movies this year. I just <laughs> I couldn't be, man. Yeah. Um, so my number seven is uh, Freaky, actually. Oh, okay. Because it, it was such a stupid escape movie, and I appreciated it. I you needed pre- a movie like that, honestly. No, exactly. And I think that's why a lot of these movies are. They were great escape movies that just let me forget about the virus and about fucking lockdown and that there are no movie theaters. And just let me chill. You know what I mean? Uh, and Freaky did that for me. Um, we popped it on, we got it on VOD, and we watched it on TV. And that time just flew like that. Uh, I remember watching, I think I saw the first five minutes before I watched it with Nikki. And it was just one of those brutal fucking kills I've ever seen, where he stuffs like a, a bottle down some kid's throat and just like slams his throat and breaks the bottle. Kids bleeding all over the place. And that just made me go, oh, fuck, this is going to get real and fast. Um, I enjoyed it. It was just, again, a dumb, great movie to turn your brain off to and enjoy. And a, a great concept in practice. Uh, Vince Vaughn made that movie as much of an asshole that he is. He made that movie work. Uh, I don't think they can do a sequel without him, which they murdered him. So we'll see how they do it. If they do Look, it. Remember, they got to they gotta cross over this one with... Uh, Happy Death Day to you. With Happy Death Day, yeah. And we'll see. Maybe she was there the day the girl kept rewinding. I don't know. We're going to find out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, my number seven. And I'm sorry, folks, if I'm not sounding too passionate about some of my picks, it's just that. I'm too passionate. That's the problem. <laughs> no, I want I want to love movies. I wanted to love a lot of the movies this year the way you love them, but I can't because a lot of the movies I was looking forward to in 2020 got stalled out. Between mm-hmm. Black Widow, between... Godzilla versus Kong between uh, 007 and a litany of other movies that I was so looking forward to. A lot of them got pushed back. So, folks, I'm sorry if I'm not as hyped as Chema for some of these movies. I'm just, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm coming back from vacation, so I'm just, I I just have that energy, man. You son of a bitch. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, Number six. Um, Number six. Uh, I'm gonna stay in the anime camp for, for for a second because I need to talk about this movie. Um, number six, another anime film. This uh, this came out on Netflix, and it was also near the start of the year. And I actually wrote a review on this for the Rollback website, and it's one of my favorite reviews that I've written. And uh, I love this one. It's called A Whisker Away, and it's so simple, man. It's uh, but simple just sometimes work. Uh, A Whisker Away is an attempt to make one of those B low level Ghibli films kind of on the vein on the cat returns and uh, Pompoko, like things like that. If you're, if you're an anime fan, you definitely know what I'm talking about. If you're not an anime fan, you might know what I'm talking about, but you know, Ghibli, they're, they're the studio that made uh, Princess Mononoke, Spirit Away, uh, Totoro, all those. Um, this feels like a movie that's trying to replicate that style. And, you know, if you're going to shoot for, you know, you might as well shoot for the best, which, you know, Ghibli might be, you know, one of the best animation studios ever. A Whisker Away is an attempt to replicate that formula to a, with a bit of a modern edge. And it almost works, but it manages to be better at just being its own thing. It's a story about this young junior high school girl who has a crush on this boy. And she is not... But it's like different. She's not like, oh, I'm shy. He's not going to notice me. She's not like the girl from Freaky. She's the total opposite. She's a total spaz. She's fucking crazy. And like she walks in every day and she looks at this boy and just jumps into his arms. Just like, hi, what's up? And this guy is like a little bit shy. So it's it's like a change of formula. And I like that. And then the whole twist is that this girl finds this mask and she puts it on and she transforms into a cat. And that cat is his pet. And so she spends time with him as a cat. And it's one of those things where like, you know, magical realism, 
Like there's magic in this, but there's not the main focus. The main focus is the relationship between these two and the personality of this girl. But there's also a darker uh, story going on in the back with her, her, her parents being divorced and his dad is remarrying. And uh, God, there's so much going on into this, this, this such a small scale film that I ended up loving and I ended up coming back to because it was so entertaining. Uh, the main character Mugi, she's she's a she's a blast. If you watch this in Japanese, she's great. If you watch it in English, she's voiced by one of my favorite voice actors, Cherami Light, and she just kicks the butt out of this character. She is so funny. She, uh, I, I I knew I I knew her voice because she is the voice of Makoto in Persona Five, and that's a very you know high school uh, um, super serious, uh, super smart. Uh, class president character and she's super like serious and dignified and in this role she's just spassing out exploding and I don't know how she does both perfectly but she does she's a talent uh, uh, the, the rest of the voice cast is also great not a lot of big names it's mostly voice actor stuff but the voice actors who are kicking the butt of, the, of this movie the animation is beautiful. It's very simple. It doesn't need to be that complicated. This was one for the families, definitely. Watch this with your uh, watch this with your family. Watch this with your partner. You can watch it with anyone of any age, and they'll kind of understand it. I love watching it as a twenty-six year old because it kind of reminded me of what it was like to be at that age. And you know, when you have a crush, and you kind of just go home, and you're like, you get like that giggly feeling. And I don't know. It kind of gave me that feeling back because it was. It wasn't always pretty. Sometimes it's ugly and it's ugly here and it's well represented. And I like that. I like when a movie can make me feel something, not sell me something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, if you're, if, if, if you, or you know, someone who's not that very well into anime or they're kind of scared to, to, to try it. I think this is a good place to start because it's simple. It's not, it's not very overwhelming. It's not that weird. And I think this is a movie really for everyone. I don't know anyone who watched it and didn't like it. Uh, people kind of forgot about it when 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 ta when uh, when time passed, but I still think it's very real watchable. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my number six, A Whisker Away. And from A Whisker Away, we walk into a series. Well, the first of hopefully what will be a series of movies. Um, my number six is a net. Well, not a Netflix original. Enola Holmes. Oh, nice. Because again, a lot of the movies uh, on my list are about escapism, and uh, Enola Holmes was such a fun movie to watch. It was such a fun, laid-back movie that has some cruel truths to it. But uh, Millie Bobby Brown was a great actress in it. She was able to take on the role and really make it her own. I like. I can really appreciate the you know fourth wall breaks. It's the kind of movie that I feel like can be watched now, and that can be watched you know ten years from now. It feels like it's going to be timeless. It feels like it's going to be one of the new, like, classics, you know? Uh, and I don't say that very easily, you know? It feels like a movie that will be rewatched again, you know, several times in the future. Gosh, it was just such an uppity movie. And I appreciate that. There aren't, that, there aren't enough films that are like that. My number my number six, uh, Nola Holmes. I'm sorry, my, again, folks. Just, like, really simple, happy movies. Like, let's just enjoy this fucking time right now, all right? It's 2020. Let's keep it light. That's really that's really all it is, man. That's really all it is. <laughs> Speaking of uh, just uppity, happy films, let's jump into probably the. This is the moment when once again I break and I just you know, I say fuck it, I had a blast. I'm putting this here, you know. Number five, Bill and Ted Face the Music. Hey, Bill and Ted Face the Music was the dumbest, stupidest. <laughs> Funniest, most. Uh, if you told me to explain to people what a himbo is, I would show them this movie. <laughs> okay. What the fuck is a himbo? A himbo is a man, a very pretty man who's mm -hmm. very muscular and is very, very stupid. Think, oh, like a bimbo, but a himbo. Think, think Kronk from Emperor's New Groove or George from the Jungle, you know? Yeah. You know, you know, mm -hmm. a very tall, very pretty man, very muscular man who respects women and, you know, he's not going to hurt you. He's just, you know, nice. That's what a himbo is. And this movie has big himbo energy, okay? But Bill and Ted Face the the beauty of Bill and Ted Face the Music comes from uh, how simple and how much fun is having with its own concept, you know? 
Uh, Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves have teased and joked about making a, a, a third bill and said, and this is this one blows the first two out of the water. This is such a fun, joyous ride because they're joined by it's not just them, it's their daughters, you know. Uh, Bill and Ted are, are, are fathers now, and their daughters are called <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> Sorry, it's just I. I <laughs> Their daughters are called Thea and Billy, <laughs> named after the other. <laughs> so <laughs> Bill names his daughter Thea and Jesus. Ted names her Billy. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> and they're played by Samara Weaving, who's been popping up in all these uh, horror films, more specifically in Ready or Not and The Babysitter. And then uh, the other daughter is played by uh, Bridget Lundy Pine, who played the sister in uh, that show on Netflix that I forgot his name. Um, I'll, I'll remember at some point. They're really good in that. Um, Bill and Ted Facing Music has a very simple concept. Bill and Ted need to write the world's greatest song that's going to unite everyone in peace. They were supposed to do it, but by the end of the, of the second film, they never did it. Now they're old, they're playing weddings, everything's going terrible. And, but they're still their happy, bumbly selves. They kind of haven't never given up. And their daughters are exactly the same. And they're so funny to watch because they're literally acting exactly like Bill and Ted act, but they're teenagers. And they're so funny because they, they're, all, they're not even doing like a self-parody. They're doing exactly what Bill and Ted were doing in the 80s. But it really works in this version. And so what happens? Kristen Shaw shows up out of nowhere and is like, yo, you got to write the song. What the hell? So they, so it becomes a time travel movie. Bill and Ted travel to the future to meet their future selves to get the song. And their daughters travel to the past to get the musicians to play in the band. We get musicians like Jimi Hendrix, like Mozart, like uh, what the fuck's his name? Um, do, 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 Jimi Hendrix, Louis Armstrong. The guy who plays Louis Armstrong was so, was such a beautiful, what a beautiful performance. It was such a small niche thing, but I wanted to hug this guy. He was so good at playing Louis Armstrong. If they do a biopic, cast this guy. He was so good. Um, <laughs> but the main thing about Dylan said is that while it is funny throughout, it becomes very endearing by the end. There's I know the concept is very cheesy and it's very easy to fall into uh, corniness, but it never does. There's a moment by the end where we finally hear the song that's going to save uh, and, and unite the world. And it does end up uniting the world. And it's such a beautiful moment in, the, in this very dumb, <laughs> very stupid movie. There's this very lovely endearing moment by the end. And I think that's a movie that came out right around when the pandemic hit and it hit in the right place. I needed to watch a movie like that. And I'm so glad that it did. I loved Bill and Ted Face the Music. I think more than being a funny film, it was an endearing film. And if you have one of those days where you feel like uh, all hope is lost, we've been locked up for almost a year. I think this is a great movie to focus at escapism, but also remind ourselves that we can be greater and we can be amazing as a race of humans. And that's what Bill and Ted Facing Music is all about. It's the movie that came out at the right time. What Animal Crossing did for video games, this movie did for movies. So I love Bill and Ted, Wild Stallions Forever, number five. My people. Yeah. Oh, uh, so shit, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go from like a really hopeful movie about the future to a movie that's downright depressing. Uh, have you heard of a little movie called Fat Man? Or the fat man. You told me about this. Yes. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, what if Santa Claus was real and some pissed off rich little bastard hired a hitman to hunt him down and kill him? Ladies and gentlemen, you have the fat man, which is probably my new fairy classic uh, Christmas movie. I'm going to straight up and say it's going to be Elf, uh, Krampus, and the fat man. Those are going to be my three go-to uh, Christmas movies when I have children. Yes. <laughs> Mel Gibson, my God. I didn't realize how funny he could be, but this movie has such dry and fucked up humor that it's worth it. Um, just completely out of the blue, weird film. And I remember when the, the trailer first came out, I was like, they hired a hitman to try and kill Sansa? And it's such a weird concept that shouldn't work, but somehow it fucking does. Um 
it's endearing in the most stupid way that you can imagine. Um, a film with such a ridiculous concept should not work by all means, but it does. Uh, you believe the killer. You believe the little spoiled brat. I mean, the kid who plays him is magnificently uh, hatred. Plays the hatred magnificently. Um, just such a dumb, fun movie to watch, though. Uh, something I would definitely recommend watching with people if you have a dark sense of humor or at the very least you can laugh at some messed up jokes. Watch this movie. Um, and the whole thing, the way they explore Santa, what if he was really real, you know, feels a little too authentic to be fake. You know, I believe the U.S. government would try to get him on their side. I believe that uh, he would have a problem because uh, there aren't too many, there aren't enough good kids in the world. And he's having problems, you know, trying to, to be positive and be jolly. I do think there's a little bit too much bullshit message when it comes to like Mel Gibson bitching while he's Santa, all these kids nowadays all suck. Yeah, because the kids of the 50s were really good, all those racist little bastards. <laughs> but none the Spoken fucking less. Spoken like a true racist himself, you know? Yeah, the, the anti-Semite that he is. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is uh, as dumb of a movie as it is, it's so fun, I couldn't help but enjoy it. I watched it probably three times within the course of a few days. Uh, twice at work during my lunch break, I was able to get it done in, you know, two different sittings. And then once when I got home and then one more time before I did my review, it's such a stupid movie, but man, it works so well. I would watch it again. And it's going to be part of my Christmas lineup from this point going forward. So fat man, if you haven't seen it, folks, you, you, uh, owe it to yourself to watch this great Christmas movie. And I use that word very fucking loosely. <laughs> All right. So we're nearing up to the number four last four um number four this is probably the most serious film that i have on my on my list so this is this, this is what it, where i put on my critic cat and my critic blazer and i go, and I go like oh yes film ah uh, yes filmmaking yes um and number four is trial of chicago seven my number four uh, Oh yeah, we always we always do this. We, we always, always have like, one. We always have one. at least one. <laughs> yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, number four, Trial of Chicago Seven. Yeah. Well, we 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 saw it. We reviewed it together. Um, we you, you if you're more interested in see, seeing that, we we have a whole review on it. But man, what a bomb this movie was in a good way. I was about to say, wait, what? Yeah, in no. a good way. A movie that was definitely needed. A movie that definitely fit the political times. Uh, but I think, didn't you say uh, fucking Andy Sorkin had the balls to say the movie didn't change with the times. The times changed because of the movie or for the movie. Yeah, and we were all like, okay, sure, buddy. Fuck, you write something more positive than you son of a bitch. <laughs> hey, he wrote The West Wing. Leave the man alone. <laughs> mm. He only wrote the first four seasons. Yeah. Then it got bad. No, anyway. no, no. He only wrote the first. Uh, was it the newsroom or was it that? He also wrote the newsroom. Yeah, but the okay, only the first season was good. Anyway, um, Trial of Chicago Seven was good, start to finish, in in, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, it's another one of those movies that definitely not for everyone, hmm. but I liked it. <laughs> it was definitely for me. Like the performances were crazy as shit. The the way that it kept spl splicing like scenes from the real life riots. Uh, the, 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 the full-on fight in the park that, that was one of the stronger scenes has one of the cheesiest but most effective endings I think in my in the in the in the last few years. Uh, Aaron Sorkin uh, is a fantastic screenwriter. He's shaping up to becoming a really good director. I, I've said in the review, I, I'll, I'll say it again. I don't think the great the great American Aaron Sorkin film hasn't been made yet, but this is a good. Like step forward. I think this movie is batshit good. It's a step in the right direction, definitely. Um, yeah. Charlotte Chicago 7, very important, very current film, uh, a movie that I think needs to be watched by everybody if possible. Mm -hmm. um, man, it's a very powerful movie. And I remember uh, it's hard to get a reaction out of me when it comes to a movie. It's hard to get an emotional, like a crying reaction out of me, but this movie managed to actually get a reaction out of Nikki. I remember when uh, when they uh, gag uh, the gentleman uh, oh, yeah. during the movie and they beat him and whatnot. Tears. There were actually tears there. And I just remember I, w I was so angry on the inside. It, it, it sparked uh, a raw reaction, just like, what the fuck is this? 
And it's insane because that actually happened multiple times in the actual trial of him being bound and gagged because he would he kept standing up for himself. Um, and various scenes throughout this movie where you see, you know, attempts at political justice, social justice. Um, and there were just so many scenes. And Andy Sorkin, for all, for all his flaws as a writer, which he does have some, yeah. He writes this movie in such a manner that people who are not familiar with courtroom, with you know the courtroom or whatnot, are able to fully follow everything and understand to a point where even when uh, Michael Keane's character is being questioned, ah, oh, I understand, but all his record, all his testimony shall be struck from the record. What? Yeah, no, I get it, but like you know, this is going to be a one-sided thing, and I'm racist, so yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I never felt lost watching it. Like I, I was and, always, and that's a hell of a thing, man. Like that's a hell of a thing to be able to do that and say, "Hey, I'm not lost." That's impressive. That's yeah. very impressive. Yeah, the movie's like two hours long. It's long, mm-hmm. and it's the uh, it's the whole year. This is the only two hour film that it ended, and my immediate thought was, "I need to watch this again." Mm-hmm. You know, it's the only time where I felt like that, and it's. Mm, like this is uh like like i don't care if it's if it's like a i don't care if it's like a dumb guy thing but this is one of those like dumb guy movies to me like i watched it and by the end i was like fuck yeah law like <laughs> i don't know it just worked like this is this is one of those movies that like i don't care if it makes me sound pretentious i think it's fucking brilliant so there it is number four 12 chicago seven and i'm it guessing is- that's your that's your take as well yeah, uh, I would have to agree. Um, I pretty much got everything out of the way already. The the whole how I felt about it. Yeah. Um, Great performances too. I forgot to say that. Great performances too. From everyone, I'll say. I'm true. You know, uh, I think this term is used a little too much, but I I think it fits a true all star cast, a true powerhouse Definitely. cast. Definitely. Um, With no so, main character, like you're, you're just following all these characters, just to see what's happening. Yeah. yeah, props to them. They were actually able to spread out the the attention there. I thought the main character was going to be Jason Gordon Levitz, but no. As it turns out, no, they they really spread out a lot. But in my, I didn't realize it was going to be the quote unquote bad guy at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, so, yeah. No um, real bad guy here either, except for the judge. Fuck that judge. <laughs> man, I want to punch that old bastard in the face. <laughs> I'm not all for like beating up old people, but I feel like I would like to meet him in the back of an alley with my friends, uh, Beat Bob and Rocksteady, and there will be no video cameras or witnesses. <laughs> yeah, what a punchable villain this one was. Yeah, um, I think I think I saw that in the review. Like, God, he has yeah. such a punchable face. He will, yeah, but I think that's that's a benefit to the actor. Like, well done, you know. Yeah, we were able to, and he didn't do anything outwardly for us to hate him. It was just like he acted so naturally racist. <laughs> that he was just like this son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, reminds me of some other old bastard who has almost no hair, who's pretending, you know, we just got evicted from his home, a big white home. Fuck that guy. Next, number three. You're number three, sir. <laughs> number three. Um, from here on out, it's all animation. So, here we go. Number three. I have a. I have a bit of a. I don't. I, I don't know how you would react. I, I. I don't know how to. I have a bit of a like a high school crush, old flame, the one that never, the one that got away, kind of relationship with this studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an animation studio called Cartoon Saloon, and they're Irish, and they have a tendency to make these beautiful, traditionally animated two D cell shaded beautiful movies but they tend to come out around the same time that another big studio releases a masterpiece and that becomes a problem because you know there's a party going on there's a rager and they show up with this beautiful delicious you know rare bottle of wine that only is open like once every two three years but we're in a party and we're drinking a keg and the keg is fucking raging, you know? <laughs> That's how it feels when, when this movie comes out. And we want the bottle. We want to have that, that chat and that conversation. And we want them at the party. But they, it's kind of hard. To, it's it's kind of like when it's your birthday and you get all, 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 all your friends together, even the ones that haven't met each other. And it's just, it's fucking weird, you know? The, the, there's no synergy there. That's how yeah. it feels when they release that movie. 
But after a while, you know, you call them back. You're like, hey, let's get coffee. And oof. What fucking movie is this, man? <laughs> like, Jesus. Um, I'm talking about Wolf Walkers, the new Cartoon Saloon oh, okay. film. Okay. Um, Wolf Walkers, much in the vein of the previous films made by Cartoon Saloon, The Secret of Kells, The Song of the Sea, and The Breadwinner some of the most unique, most beautiful animated films of the past few years, but they have a tendency to, like I said, they come out at the same time when a juggernaut comes up next to them and it becomes a little easy to ignore, but they shouldn't be ignored. Wolf Walkers is just animatedly speaking, the most unique looking film that came out this year. Mm-hmm. It, it has shades of like Samurai Jack uh, combined with like traditional anime combined with Irish folklore. And it's such a simple story that, but you don't watch, this is one of those movies that you're not going to watch for the story. You're going to watch for the animation because sadly, and I hate saying this, this might have a really weak story. Okay. The story in this one is a little weak. It's basically brave with a little bit less going on and a little bit, more direction that's what wolf walkers is is a story of this girl who lives with her dad and she's this they live inside of a city and the dad is a not a soldier but he's a he's a traveler he goes out he gets food he comes back he works for the king and his daughter is she's an archer she wants to go out she wants to see the world but he's like no it's too dangerous you can't go out and oh lo and behold she goes out she meets this girl who was raised by wolves and they become fast friends and we have a little bit more of magic realism. We have a little bit of Irish mythology. And like I said, unique animation. This was beautiful from start to finish. Um, the only problem that, that the movie has is I think the story and two, the fact that it is very limited. You can only watch this on Apple TV Plus and nobody has Apple TV Plus except for me. But there is a problem there for people that want to watch this movie because it's so limited to that. It didn't come out on theaters, it didn't come out anywhere else. It's the only place where you can watch it. Now, I'm not going to say you should do this, but... If you buy an Apple product, you get a full year of Apple TV Plus. That's how I watched it. So <laughs> redeem it because you probably have it. Um, because they, they don't really like address this. You just maybe I should buy my Apple Watch. <laughs> they just you, I just kind of ended up stumbling into this. But I love Tom Moore, the director. I think he does wonderful work. I hope his movies do keep coming out, and I hope the studio keeps pumping out movies. But just select a better year to come out, please, because we <laughs> want to keep you in our schedule. I want them to have an Oscar. I want them to make a billion dollars. But it's going to be hard when you keep releasing it on the same day that Soul came out, man. Like, you can't do this to me. Like, it's so... <laughs> I love Wolf Walkers. It was beautiful. The animation is great. Watch it. If you don't have Apple TV+, Plus, find a way to watch it. Find a board on that has an account that just watch it because this movie deserves to be watched and watch it on your best tv okay uh <laughs> watch it with headphones watch it with the best best sound screen sound system because this was just chef's kiss beautiful beautiful animation and it deserves to be acknowledged it deserves to be talked about don't let cartoon saloon die please i need them <laughs> to keep making movies because I'm sure, so... apple, I'm sure apple gave them plenty of money i'm sure they did but Ah, please, if you find yourself with time, watch Wolf Walkers. Be indoctrinated. Join my cold. I will. I will keep. I'm just gonna sh- start showing up to people's houses with like, "Have you heard of our Lord and Savior Tom Moore today?" Because uh, the, I, I fucking love Wolf Walkers. Um, most of Wolf, the movies are available Wolf anywhere Walkers, else. Right? Wolf, Wolf Walkers. Walkers? That's correct. Beautiful little animated film. Just uh, great. Watch it if you get a chance to watch it. Oh, wow. Watch it. Yeah. It looks gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Huh. All right, folks. Maybe watch it. I might chomp up some time. Hmm. I'm sure there are other means besides Apple TV of watching this film that we will not speak of. I'm sure there is, but I I, I would prefer to hear about your number three before we get them deep, before you get, you know, thrown Demo- into jail. Or demonetized. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what money? Uh my number three is the invisible man. Oh, nice. Have you seen that one? I did. But Great. I kind of forgot about it. 
<laughs> uh, incredible performance and a great movie. Um, props to them. Their execution of this movie was incredible. An incredible performance. Elizabeth Moth carries this film on her back and then some, but God damn, if she doesn't do an incredible job. I did a written review on this movie and wow, it still holds up. I did rewatch it recently and it's still stressful as all hell. Um, the director, who, uh, the man who made this movie, uh, a Mr. Lee Walnil? Walnil. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry if I He's butcher. Good. I'm sorry if I butcher your name, but sir, bravo to you. You took a concept that was very dodgy and made it incredible while fusing it with this whole idea of like, you know, this woman who's are, who's being, she is in an abusive relationship. She really is. Uh, and she's trying to get away from it. But the twist is her jackass evil ex-husband slash boyfriend um, is at the forefront of this incredible technology. And instead of using it to you know, better the world, he's going to use it to stalk the living shit out of his ex-wife uh, and make her life a living hell to a point where she's in a goddamn mental institution. But she's able to stab his brother in the throat. Um... The suit was really creepy. The, the the idea, the fact that it wasn't a serum, it was a suit, somehow worked. They made it work. They made the whole thing work. Um, and the ending where she's able to use the suit to kill him? My God. Like, genuinely incredible. Um, Zeus, I love the dog. How she frees him in the very beginning because he has a shot collar on. And she's like, I can't take you with me. And she's like, I'll oh, fuck it. And he take, she takes off the collar. Um, such a redeemable character um such a tough situation but I, you're never not on her side and you're never not on the edge of your seat because you're always wondering in the corner is that where he's at um and that was honestly done purposefully and it was done very well um props um i can't recommend it enough then uh, the invisible man is probably the best horror movie of the year last year it was a. Uh... That's what the, the 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 new monster universe that they wanted to do. That that was like their immediate reboot, and I think really worked better for them yeah. than what they were trying to do with the mummy and all that. Uh, that's number three. Yes, sir. Number two. It hurts, but I had to do it. My number two is Soul. My two. Oh, there it is. Uh, and I I know I just spoke all this about Wolf Walkers, but it's. it's, it's Come on, did you see Soul? Like, how, how? <laughs> it's so good. It's so hard. It's so hard. It's like, it's so, it was so hard to do. But yeah, yeah, Soul, Soul's my number two. Okay, it's your number two as well. We, we did a review on it. Your, uh, Nick, Nicky joined, joined us for that. And it, it, it was one of my favorite reviews that we've done. But Soul, my God, uh, masterpiece, a rebirth for Pixar. Uh, just a fucking game changer for them. Um, Jesus, just a, as close as a movie can get to perfect. The, the I have no words. It was just beautiful. It was amazing. I think the first thing I think about when it comes to Soul uh, is actually the animation. And then the, and bear in mind, the concept and the writing and the, the dialogue and the visuals are great. But to me, the very first thing that I think about is not only the animation, but the experimentation with the animation the way they create the characters, the Jerry's and everything, and the Terry, and the animation's gorgeous and genuinely stunning. Like, wow. But then you get behind, you get past the beautiful animation and it has an amazing story with such a great concept and ideal and the manner in which they approach things to a point where this might be the best original movie since Inside Out, if not, like, maybe since The Incredibles. Um the way they tackle a very difficult uh, subject, that being death and the afterlife, heaven, hell. Uh, and they got some actual laughs out of me, not just like, oh, that was funny. Like, I laughed, you know. Are we in H E double hockey sticks? Hell, 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 <laughs> hell. Like, it, it was funny. It was genuinely funny. And they found such a great way to approach a hard subject that I think a lot of parents have trouble talking to their kids about. You can show this movie to your kids and boom, your parenting from that degree is done. We, yeah. Dad, what happens when I die? Let's go watch Soul, son. <laughs> oh, God. It was uh, a beautiful spiritual sequel to Inside Out. I, I feel like two, you, you, you can watch them back to back and they really complement each other. They're kindred spirits, really. Pete mm -hmm. Doctor, the director of both of them, probably the best director working with Pixar right now. 
I can't mm-hmm. wait to see what he does next. It it sounds like he's gonna take over Lasseter's spot, which you know, f- fucking great. Um, but yeah, I just uh, so simple but so effective, and I think a movie that it was a nice way to end the year because I, much like everyone else, kind of watched this on Christmas Day when it premiered on Disney Plus, and I would have loved to have seen it in theaters, but kind of watching it at home. Christmas Day with my family, it was kind of perfect. And I loved it. I love the movie. It's, like I said, as close to perfect. We have a full review on this. If you, if you want to hear us just geek out, geek out about, about this movie more. But yes, if you've heard that it's great, it's because it's great. Really, there's no lies here. It's fantastic. Go watch it. It could easily compete for like best picture at the Oscars. It's that good. Do you think, has Pixar nominated it? Or has Disney nominated it for Best Picture? It, it Potentially, it could win, honestly. For sure, it's going to win, have to win Animated Movie of the Year. Like, I, there's no, there's no, like, I'm oh, sorry. I'm so sad about Cartoon Saloon. They're never going to get their due. Uh, <laughs> it should have picked an easier year. Oh, God. All right, so that's that's number two. Soul, yours is Soul as well. Um, I have no idea what your number one is going to be. I'm lost. I'm stumped. Well, like you wanna, gonna... well, what's your number one? You first. Um, or do you want me to do mine first? I don't care. You know what? You, you go first on this one. Just because I'm so more it, curious. So it's a little movie that uh, it seems obvious in hindsight. <coughs> Birds of Prey. <laughs> Chema has just taken off his headphones oh, and he's kind of pissed. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Of fucking course. God damn it. Of course it is. You know what? Just just when you <laughs> just when I thought you had pushed you have put a you have pulled a fast one on me, Luna, and you fucking do this shit. The again. fast one was that you thought I pulled a fast one. Every fucking year, <laughs> man. Without fail, like this motherfucker don't miss. Like in the heat of controversy, he don't miss. In the heat of battle, he don't miss. <laughs> All right, talk about birds of prey. All right, I. Hey, to be fair, it was your number eight, motherfucker. It was my number eight, and I, and like I said, I enjoyed the film, but number one. Okay, so no, uh, go off, go, go go off, please. I want to hear it. So uh, there was a while back uh, where. We talked about a very tough year. Uh, I think that was 2017. It was a tough transition year. And do you remember my number one that year? My number one? It was a dual set of number ones. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Justice League and uh, Batman and Harley Quinn, the animated ones. Yeah, and yeah. namely because those films were, for me, a bit, a lot of escapism. Because for, that was just a batshit insane year for me. From graduating, trying to find a real job, dealing with uh, family and friends and everything. It was 2017 might still be my most stressful year that I've ever fucking had. And I got married, mate. Like, that is a stressful time. But you married, like, next year, not that year. No, no, but that's what I mean, though. Like, including the year I got married and we moved in together and, like, moved halfway across the state away from our loved ones. Yeah. 2017 was still more stressful than that, than that. For, for context, everyone, the state is Texas. So it's not like a small ass state. It's like a big ass state. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so like 2017 was a fucking stressful year. And yet still, I found a way to escape with those two movies. For just a few hours, I was a kid again, just watching Saturday morning cartoons, enjoying my popcorn and just like de-stressing. And in that same sense, uh, we saw... Um, Birds of Prey and the Fabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinzel uh, or Harley Quinn and I escaped again I was able to turn off my brain I was able to just enjoy literally nothing else in this world mattered for about two hours other than this incredibly funny um, breakneck speed film that is uh, Girls Get It Done but better to me I've seen The Boys season two. I finally watched season one and two. We watched it like in two days. Um, And I'm not saying like girl power should always be a thing. But to me, this movie took that concept and did it properly. You know, took a character that was often a write off or a glorified sidekick and gave her her own legs to stand on in the story that to me at least holds up 
very small scale, no world ending, no world ending threat, just a really fun movie. Um, that was able to make me laugh and joke and cringe when she broke kneecaps because fuck, my kneecaps hurt after watching that movie. Um, a character that's funny that I enjoyed that I watched it in, um, in theaters. This was, I think, maybe the last film I actually watched in theaters uh, at the at the Alamo, the Alamo Dome, the Alamo Draft House with some great food. Nikki loved the movie, actually, which was a turn on. Like, like, it was great because normally she doesn't like the same movies I do. I just, I really enjoy the movie. And I, I can, if there was ever a year for escapism, it may have been this year. And I was easily able to escape with Birds of Prey. I've watched it more than a few times since it came out and I can rewatch it again. And I'm really looking forward to Suicide Squad. Also, fun fact, the only two characters that technically have sequels as of right now, as of the time of this recording, are Wonder Woman and Harley Quinn. The holy one of the one of them is the holy trinity of DC that's been around for what since like the 40s. The other one's a character that was just made in the mid 90s that just got that fucking popular. So thank you very much. All right. So your number one is still DC. DC. How many years? How many fucking years in a row? <laughs> that had to be one year where it wasn't DC. There was one year where you put, I think it was Batman vs. Superman was number two, and then your number one was uh, Fantastic Beast, and that was like as closest as you got. But after that, it's been just DC to the max. And which, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what I tell you every time we watch a DC film. It's not for me, but I'm so glad it is for you, except that at this time it was for me. <laughs> All right. So that's your number one. Mm-hmm. What's your number one, mate? All right. My number one. This might take a while, but I'll get there. Um, my number one, I have, a, I have a bit of a story with this one because my number one is also an animated film. We might as well stick with them. Uh, we're back to anime one more time. Um, I was waiting for this movie to come out for like a long while because the movie that came out before it that kind of connects to it is very special to me. Uh, my number one, I'll, I'll go, I'll go straight to the point. My number one is weathering with you. Mm-hmm. The new Makoto Shinkai film. Makoto Shinkai made a movie in 2016 called your name. And that is my favorite movie of the whole 2020 de- 2010 decade. Okay. So your name is special to me. Um, I have a, like a thing with Shinkai, the director, because uh when I first came to college and I was living in the dorms and I was just a young 18 year old kind of trying to restart his life, you know, uh, new people, new city, new state, new country, you know, just trying to like become the person that I'm going to become eventually. I went through this very harsh breakup. And in the midst of that breakup, I kind of submerged myself in movies and I discovered a bunch of movies that are still my favorites to this day. One of them being The Secret of Kells, which was a, a movie from by Tom Moore, the guy who did uh, Wolf Walkers. So I discovered Secret of Kells. I discovered The Social Network, which became one of my favorites uh, as well. And I discovered this little movie called Five Centimeters Per Second. And it was this beautiful story, beautifully animated short film about a breakup, you know, it's, very simple. It's about a breakup, and it just it hurt. It, it like it, it was like throwing salt in a wound. But I kept my mind on this guy on Shinkai. I was like, who, who? What's this guy gonna do? And then he releases your name, and your name is a fucking just. That's the most accessible anime has ever been. You can show your name to someone who doesn't care about anime, and they'll fucking care about anime. That's how good that movie is. And your name was a fucking trip and it was a hit and everyone loved it. And it turned a lot of people into his work. And that is stressful. If you're a director, that is stressful as hell because now you're like, how the fuck am I going to follow that up? You know, the people who just did Zelda breath of the wild are right now thinking, what the fuck do we do now? You know, (laughs) that's, that's exactly what this guy is thinking. So he's like, you know, what if I want to make a smaller film? Now people want something as big or as bigger or bigger than your name. What the fuck am I going to do? So he's stressed and he decides to make this movie. Uh, your name was about this boy and this girl that never met each other and just randomly wake up in each other's bodies. And then Weathering With You takes the magic realism and it's both a movie about magical realism, 
about this girl that can randomly just because control the weather. It's a love letter to Tokyo, and it's an anti-gun <laughs> movie also. And this is that the reason the reason why it's number one is not just because of its themes or because of the beautiful soundtrack made by Rad Wimps or or because of the characters. It's because this is the most gorgeously animated film I've seen in my fucking life. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't care if that's a big statement. Uh, your name, your name is beautiful. This is fucking gorgeous. Okay, um, it doesn't. You know how Soul looks amazing when it's creative, but it also looks realistic when it needs to be. Yeah. This is. This doesn't need to look realistic, but it feels like a world that's real. Okay. Uh, Tokyo feels alive in this animation. It's colorful, but it's also like so detailed. It does it doesn't waste like any time. Uh, the story is very simple. It's about this boy that escapes from his home, gets to Tokyo, and meets this uh, get, gets this job as a, as a writer for the for this magazine, and he meets this girl that can randomly just control the weather. And Tokyo right now is raining. It's raining every day and every night without stopping. And they found out that she can control the weather. So she, so he starts a service with her when he just takes her somewhere and she comes out, she comes the weather for like a couple of hours. Some people, some people can have like an event or like a bake sale or something and they just charge and they just profit and they're kids and they're just having a fucking ball because they're kids and they're just doing that. And people just accept it. They're like, oh, there's a girl that controls the weather. She, thank God you're here. You know, please, I'm trying to have a fucking quinceañera with my children. You know, can you please clear this out? And they're like, yeah, Absolutely. And that's that's all it is. That's all it fucking is. And it's and the fact that Shinkai decided to make this film as kind of like a spiritual sequel to to your name, and also kind of a sequel because we see a couple of characters come back. Um, it's kind of cool that a movie like this exists. It, it's kind of cool that this animation is the most beautiful animation. You know, uh, a lot of people used to call Shinkai the new Miyazaki, the new Satoshi Kon. I think he's in a league of his own. And the fact that he has such a younger sounding voice in his films, it's it's great. Weathering With You is a beautiful film, is, is gorgeous. The animation is great. It's not better than your name. And that pains me to say, but it shouldn't be better than your name. It should just be as good. It should just be a good film. And I'm glad that he did something like this because that way it's a good middle point between, okay, I'm going to give the people something kind of like your name and I can go do something else different after this. I'm so glad he didn't do your name too or your name uh, like a different side or anything. It's just another story in the same universe that you know lives by these rules. I loved it. It's not quite kid-friendly, not quite adult. It's perfectly in its own thing. And I beg everyone if you have it if you saw your name and you you're kind of curious about this one go for it if you haven't seen your name go for it you'll enjoy it equally this is also anime at his you know most accessible if five centimeters per second is the murakami equivalent to norwegian wood weathering with you is his kafka on the shore it's magical realism to the max it's funny it's endearing the characters are super fun and like i said the most beautiful animation I've seen probably in my life. Mm -hmm. He's perfected this formula. He's perfected this animation. I'm sure he finished this movie and he took like a nap that lasted three months. Like this is (laughs) a fucking trip. So I invite everyone, if you have, this movie's in HBO Max. If you haven't taken a chance to watch it, all of his movies are on HBO Max. Take take it, just do it. It's, you will not regret it. Number one, weathering with you. So while we were talking, I looked up some of the animation and it is gorgeous. It's like, gorgeous. I would hate to work on a movie like that though. <laughs> like the amount of time and detail. I'm pretty sure I go fucking nuts. Props like to I, them. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this guy finished the film and just like, all right. <laughs> Napped out. Jesus. It looks great. I mean, as soon as I have HBO Max, I'll probably end up watching it. Remind me, please, to watch this. You told me to watch Spirited Away and I gave it a shot. I didn't love it, but it was pretty good. Like I, I, I can rewatch it. So um when Godzilla comes out in March, remind me to rewatch this one. I'll watch this in between Justice League and Godzilla. <laughs> it's a nice pile cleanser, you know, just so you can, <laughs> you can watch something else. I, I generally think this is like a very accessible film. This one and uh and and your name. I think both of them are on HBO Max. Mm-hmm. So highly recommend 
this one's. Um, I know it's not it's not a uh, birds of prey, but <laughs> it's this is th- this Personal is why we do this. Aside. This is why we do this because as much as we love talking about the movies that we both like, this is the exercise where we just show how even if we have different likes, like we always come back to watch the same thing. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the year, man. That's the that's year twenty twenty. Top ten for twenty twenty, man. I'm looking forward to our top ten of twenty twenty one. I think I'm gonna have a lot more shit to say. I'm gonna have a significantly harder list to put together. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to can't wait to do that, man. Can't wait to keep talking movies with you. Can't wait to you know gather the whole crew, and we'll be here, man. <laughs> I think it's a, it's Snyder a, Cut might be the first time we get all four of us. So it's, we'll a, see. it's a threat, not a promise, but we're here. Um, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, so that's that's our top ten. Uh, if if everyone listening wants to share their favorite films, what they like, what they're looking forward to this year, we'll love to hear in the comments. We'll love to sound off. We'll love to hear about it. Uh, we'll love to create a conversation on that. So, but this was ours. I hope you'll like it. Uh, Eddie, anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? Um, no, just that we, so folks, a uh, little peek behind the curtain, we've reached a bit of a milestone for the rollback as far as number of episodes, number of views, you know, we've been going strong and uh, we want to continue this momentum, but we also want to thank uh, all those really loyal viewers that have stuck with us, you know, shockingly. <laughs> um, our fan base is actually growing quite a, a, a bit here and there. Um, thank you all, you know, for this, you know, we're just a bunch of morons like to talk about movies and somehow people will like it so thank you yeah and we're not going anywhere we're gonna stick uh stick to a better schedule this year but we're pretty consistent this past yeah. year we, we always had at least one to put out on saturdays yeah uh i think we're nearing like a year mm-hmm. into this uh around what march april actually april so we're getting close yeah <laughs> um well. yeah can't wait to the eventual like uh you know at some point special. when when movie theaters come back when we can travel again you know i'm just i had this i had this dream a couple uh, a couple of weeks ago where like it was the four of us and we're barbecuing and we're just chilling and we're like doing everything like live, like face to face and it's like i'm kind of looking forward to that like that's that, uh, that might be like a nice point i will host and i will make brisket for everybody how texan of you damn right <laughs> <laughs> also it's one of the few things i know i can't fuck up yeah it's just you know putting putting it on the fire and just leaving it there for like eight hours exactly hard, i can't fuck it up screw, exactly <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> all, right. All, right. all right man well this this has been great you wanna if you're listening to us via youtube please like and subscribe we're trying to grow this channel and we greatly appreciate anything you can send us if you're listening to us on any so, on any platform you can follow us on any of our links down below Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to hear more about our thoughts on movies, go to therollback.net. I've been Chema. And I've been Eddie. And, and this, this was The Rollback. The rollback. <laughs> that's, th- that's how you fucking do it, Alex. Cut it <laughs> and I cut it there. Yeah. <laughs>